Welcome to the Business of Property podcast. I'm Simon. And I'm Stuart. We talk every week about the reality of running property businesses. Stuart runs a portfolio of co-living properties with a six-figure turnover. And Simon owns buy to lets and created Patma, a leading portfolio management software system and a source of property market insights. Our quick ask as we start this week is for you to pop into the show notes and find the link to our mailing list and sign up to become part of our BOP email tribe and we will send you some interesting emails. Now, moving quickly on, Stuart has been a student landlord for 10 years or so. And this morning, before we started recording, Stuart was perhaps sharing some views that were a little negative in the, in the student market. Moaning. You could say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we thought we'd have a chat about it. And first of all, I thought it would be good to start with finding out why you got into student HMOs, student accommodation, Stuart? Yeah, the first reason was really simple. It was HMO, multi-let, higher cash flow. We've talked about that many times before. So that seemed like a good model for someone looking for cash flow. And then student just seemed like an, an easier option because there wasn't too much thinking. You find somewhere where there's a university or a large college and you find properties in that area and you set those properties up so you buy a property and you get bums on beds so really the simplicity of student appealed to me because there wasn't too much thinking involved and the other reason was at that time when we took on student letting agreements they were for terms of 50 weeks So obviously, whatever that figure was, so the room rate times the 50 weeks, you would you would measure out. So you'd plan for that as your 52 weeks, essentially. So you'd have to sort of recalibrate those numbers, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you'd always have a two week void, but but it was predictably just a two week void. Yeah. And in all honesty, the house would be more would be emptier than that because of the times that the students were going, you know, know, so when it's non-turn time, so Easter, summer, Christmas, etc. But the 50 weeks meant that, okay, so you know, essentially we can still, we can still plan out uh, the revenue that, that is going to be made from the property. Again, the, the simplicity of what we'd need to do to the property, really it's just making sure it's got a bed, a desk, a chair, and a lamp, for example. And really that was all the thinking that needed to be done. And clearly you would have agents in university towns areas that would specialize in student and again that appealed to me because i always think that people that specialize in an area have greater knowledge and can help it fill so those are really in a very succinct way what attracted me to student and why my first hmos were student properties yeah i i know from i my, my grandfather actually used to run student HMOs in Brighton and and once he'd sort of I mean he did this for many many years and and in the end he he really got it down to an art and he knew exactly how to set up the house how to to convert it from uh, what uh, originally a, a dwelling house into a, an HMO and for prepare it for students what they were looking for what they needed he knew where to put up signs in the, the notice boards in the university and things to get more applicants than he he needed and then sort of pick and choose the, the tenants he wanted. And, and yeah, as you say, it was just a, a really reliable, predictable model that, that worked well, for, for him at least, and perhaps for you. So tell us, how, how did it work at the beginning? Did, did it go as planned? Pretty much, yeah. It's, it's, it was quite straightforward that we'd find properties. So the first one was an ex-student property. So most of the properties I've bought, if not all, in the area were existing HMO properties, so House of Multiple Occupation properties. So the first one I ever bought, that was an existing student property. So interestingly, the agent that came and had a look at the house with me said, don't get that one. It's at the bottom of a hill, which means students had to walk up it to get to university. They don't like hills, even though it was still maximum 10 minute walk to the university but I just liked the property it had curb appeal 
and went against the agent because I just thought it's a really nice property. And if the worst comes to the worst, I'm sure I can do other things with it. It's been rented to students for almost 10 years now and touch wood, it hasn't not let for a term. So it's just a little sidebar there to let people know, yes, you need to speak to professionals, get their advice, but always go with what your gut feel tells you. So that first one went really well. Second one, now this is quite interesting. So the second one was a student property for some time until COVID. And after COVID, I decided to convert it and actually spend more money on it. So the short answer is probably for the first five years, the student properties ran as expected. Then we started to hit some some challenges. Okay, so perhaps we should should get into the bad, having having done some of the good. I, I don't know if you want to say sort of how how things went bad or just what's bad now. Where, where would you like to go, Stuart? Well, I'm going to start with my biggest gripe, which is what you know. And Simon was being very polite as we hit the record button. But what I was quite literally moaning about this morning was just planning the cash flow for student properties is a friggin' nightmare because you only get paid three times a year. And what that means is now that I've just accepted student rents. And this is just the way it is, by the way. And, and, and I knew this. And when I set the company up the way I set it up, and it, it, it is as expected. But it's just become harder and harder as time's gone on. And the issue is, for example, so we get paid the, the last term student rents in May. And by the way, I'm not asking anyone to uh, shed a tear on this. It's just just the way it is and and what we're talking about. But the next student rents won't be due in until early October. So essentially, we have five months then of no income. Now, of course, what you immediately say is, well, Stuart, surely you you just take that terms payments and you spread it or amortize it if we want to use accounting terms but you you know you spread it over that five months and it and it's fine but as we all know and as we've talked about with Simon on his investment recently costs are always higher than you think they're going to be and things take longer so you know we've had quite a few problems so so the, the funds in the bank and also when when there is money in the bank it tends to get spent that's that's the challenge so typically those funds won't last five months and then the next payment is in October and then you've got October, November, December and then the next payment is usually around sort of January time and then May. So the first problem is cash flow and managing the cash flow. And I, and I say this in you know my experience now in business as well as property is that that is the number one problem anyway. So if you've then got a model which only pays you three times a year, you've got to be really careful about how you're spending the business's money and yeah, essentially managing that so that you know over this barren period of five months that you're going to have enough cash in the bank by you know come the end of September, which is still a challenge for me several several years on. So is it just just the one one bad thing of cash flow? Or if you, you've got any more you want to <laughs> throw, throw well, on the pile? <laughs> the the second one isn't isn't a huge one, but does happen, which is higher maintenance because students are students, and but you know. Without arguing against it already, I say I've got two two different tenant profiles, and I wouldn't say it's hugely different. But and I would I would counter that one and suggest that you may have to maintain things a bit more often, maybe, but you're maintaining them to probably a slightly lower standard. And and actually, this might feed into some of our later discussions. But but certainly traditionally, I think students have been willing to accept a simpler property, at least, even if not sort of lower standard in other ways well i think that brings us on to the i think that brings us on to the final point which is competition is the highest it's ever been in studentsville and i know this has happened across the country but we talk about uh yeah pbsa purpose-built student accommodation and certainly in the area i invest in in the last several years I think at least 3,000 additional rooms have been brought into the market, at least. probably It's probably more than that. Do you know how big the student market is in terms of rooms in, in your, for, for that university in your area? How many students there are or how many rooms are available? Uh, how, how, many, how many students there are? So how many rooms, how many rooms are needed <laughs> per year? 
Well, obviously, some students could be local, but the the number of students is around approximately 20,000. And actually, prior to COVID, I think that had been dropping year on year. And in, and in our area, that, that was a that was counter to or or sort of converse to what was happening elsewhere in the country where I think student numbers have just been growing and growing, which is happening again and and is now happening in our area. But so in the area I invest in specifically, we had this challenge of increased supply because we had purpose-built student accommodation coming in and reducing demand. And, And obviously that's very simple economics, which is about all I'm capable of. And that that caused a couple of issues so number one was that the 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 areas the students were willing to look at had reduced so they were looking a lot closer because they now had options uh, a lot closer which meant there were the the certain areas whatever the radius is greater than a mile out they were no longer really looking at but number two which is a point you were kind of alluding to in your last point was that the quality of the accommodation was now much much higher and as you were, uh, you know, were talking pre-record is, you know, so a lot of the student places now, number one, the, the rooms are of a very high standard. So they have little studio flats, but then they have communal areas, cinema rooms, you know, foosball areas, you know, all, all of which I'm looking at, actually. So one of my properties could actually get a little cinema room in, in it. Oh, my goodness. This is not the, the student accommodation I recall. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife says that all the time, because when I tell her what I've done for the students, I mean, the amount of times where my wife said, I can't believe you're buying X product for the students and you won't even buy Y product for us <laughs> as a family. <laughs> but that's a separate conversation. So are, are you seeing PBSA with these sorts of facilities as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, that, and that's so that's what's happened is that the, that the standard has increased dramatically. However, I think what happened was that there was so much investment so quickly that they that they overestimated the, the demand that was ready for them. And some of those properties, in fact, I'm sure one of them where there was approximately 300, 350 rooms didn't get filled for some time. The property was completed, but didn't get filled for some time. So so even the what we call the you know the um, institutional investors were struggling to get their properties filled but what that meant to to the to the investors you know standard investors that are you know typical landlords like myself meant that our properties had to be of a much higher standard if we were going to compete or if we were going to get fewer voids so when you when you say high standards i mean we, we talked a little bit or you, you mentioned already, sort of um, cinema rooms and things. And that is sort of one way to understand sort of improvements. You're, you're sort of adding features, if you like. But there's also sort of other, uh, other ways to improve standards. So it could be that the property is actually clean versus not clean. I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of your properties are, are spotless, Stuart, all the time. But just, just as an example here, or it could be, that they're repainted every year versus not, and they they look a bit tattier, that sort of thing. Or it could be that they've got, I don't know, fancy artwork on the walls versus plain magnolia walls. Or it could be that they've got en suites versus shared bathrooms. Or there's lots of different levels of, of sort of standards and improving things. And it could be that you're, you're just making a, a, a good, clean, well-presented property and accommodation. Or it could be that you're actually adding features to that, that property, sort of en suites, cinema rooms, fancy artwork, etc. cetera. And, and are you finding that people are no longer happy with really good but simple and you actually have to go into the, the, the feature filling sort of space no i think i think good and simple is absolutely fine and there is still demand for it is there yeah there's i mean that's definitely there because again we're talking about different price points so there's always going to be you know so so in our area you you can you can get a room from 70 pounds a week up to let's say 150 pounds a week okay so there's always going to be a market in there but the 
the lower you are in that marketplace, the harder it's going to be to fill your property on going to the right people. And ultimately, that means the standard of your property is going to drop. And that's what we've seen. But you're, you're absolutely right. So one of my properties is what I call a flagship property, where we did put en suites in every room. We got a local artist in to put art on the walls. It looks, I mean, it looks, it looks really cool. It's, you know, the, the, the room rates are premium for the area and it's occupied, et cetera. But then there are other rooms where, yeah, it's just going to be clean. There aren't, they aren't all en suites. Some of them, it's a shared bathroom, so it's just standard. But what happened in the area was that if you were further out, you could no longer get away with, you know, the old sofa, the magnolia walls, the tatty kitchen and, and so on. It needed to be just tidied up. Otherwise, you were going to get to the bottom. And actually, I experienced this personally myself, which was what, so the property that I did do up in the end, the... We, we did a very basic refurb. So we did put a new kitchen in and so on. But then after two years, so again, what happens to me and what happens to lots of people is that if people are looking after your property, you tend to take hands off and you just assume everything's okay. But actually, after a couple of years, everything's worn. It looks a bit, bit worn. You know, the students have, have just lived in it, done nothing unusual, but it, it's now looking well lived in. So the next people coming in are going, well, actually, I'm not going to pay that rate for it. I'd probably pay 10% less. And that's what happened. So people pay less and the people that are paying less are generally, you know, less inclined to look after the property. And, you know, that's the vicious cycle that we got into. And then you need even more maintenance spend to, <laughs> to look after the property, even though you've got less income because <laughs> yeah. you're, you're at that end of the market. Yeah. Uh, and then you're facing this kind of catch-22, which is either you, you take people out of the property to do the work that you really need to do and then stop some of that income, or you just let it run down and, and, until it's it's not a viable property. And so essentially we had to do that. But the final problem that I actually haven't touched on is probably right up there with the biggest problems is utilities. Now, because in, in our area, and it's not the same in all areas, but I imagine it's in a lot of university towns, is that the model is all bills included. And that model started whenever it started 20 years ago. And in fact, some of the agents I worked with even ran some tests because I said, you know, we, we, we couldn't stomach in the last couple of years, we couldn't stomach those utilities but we ran a little test and essentially students aren't willing to go back to bills not included and to be honest why would they if you if you know i've got if you've got a fixed rate now we've talked about this before we've got caps and we can measure it and so on and so forth so those things can be in place but the cost of utilities now is a significant a significant proportion of the cost base that comes out and I you know off the top of my head but it's it's you know we've gone through these numbers before so you know those are the reasons where I would say student has become very very difficult yeah and like I say you're, you're paying those utility bills every single month so even the, the students aren't there for May to September but we'll be paying every uh, sorry we're not getting revenue from May to September and they won't be necessarily in the property in sort of July and August, but we'll still be paying those bills. Yeah, yeah. And and just to, to make this, this doom and gloom moaning episode e- even worse, I think there's a couple of things you've forgotten as well that, that you mentioned earlier. And one was that your rental period in your area, and this is going to be area specific again, has been reducing. So it used to be 50 weeks a year that you'd be able to let your properties for. But now it, it's dropped a bit. And then the the other one is that, of course, you have to look forwards to the future. And there are issues or concerns, perhaps I should say, around what might be changing in terms of the way tenancy agreements work and how that could affect students. And obviously, some some people are very concerned about the, the potential removal of Section 21. But I think with students particularly, it's more about the removal of fixed term tenancies at all, and that all tenancies would be would be assumed to be longer term. So as you forgot those in your, in your, your re-moan <laughs> for the recording, um, <laughs> do you think they're, they're lesser or, or, or do they, should they factor more into, into thinking? I think they should factor into thinking, but obviously if you're signing an agreement for 43 weeks as opposed to 50 weeks, then as, a, as an investor landlord, those numbers still have to work. And, and typically they would, but I do know landlords that do have agreements for 43 weeks. Now, most of mine 
if not all of them are on 50. Some might be on 48, which is fine because we need that time anyway, because as we talked about, you need to do maintenance. But I think it is still a concern. And obviously the Section 21 removal, the fact that at the end of the contract, people can't just might not just be able to go means you have to consider that because what happens, you know, and you, you, you raised this point in the past, a very good one. So what happens in July when one student says, actually, I'm just going to hang around for a few months when we've got another intake that are due in September. I, I personally think there's going to be ways around it. I, I don't think that's going to be a big issue. I know some people might really worry about it, but I just I think it's going to be minimal because I, I don't know many students that just want to hang around a university just for fun. They once they're done, they want to move on, and and those that want to uh, stay and live. I mean, we have had it in a couple of in the in the professional working properties where we have had sh- students in the past. One one stayed in and he stayed in the room, and that's that's fine because it's it's still a rented room. So you know, there's there's give and take in all of these situations, but um, but it does make the environment quite challenging. Indeed. So with the with a more challenging environment, more competition higher standards being required and difficulty with cash flow, both due to re- re- reduced rental weeks and uh, the, the fact that the mon- money arrives in lumps and things, and you've got increasing utility bills to, to contend with. I assume you're never going to touch student accommodation ever again, Stuart. <laughs> well, interestingly, I am looking at a 27 bed student property. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's a logical conclusion to what we've been talking about for the last half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely isn't, absolutely isn't logical. And even as we have this conversation, there's a big part of me that says, yeah, why, why do student? But as you and I repeat often on this podcast, and, and I think it's good advice, is the num- it's all about the numbers. And if the numbers do work, then the investment is good. And for me, the tenant profile shouldn't make too much of a difference. The only caveat I would apply, and and we alluded to this earlier on, was that when COVID hit, I would say at that time, within the portfolio, two thirds of the portfolio was student and one third was working professional. Right now, it's actually the the converse of that it's two-thirds working professional one-third student so I have so we have changed the mix just because we were concerned about what was happening in the student market but I still think there is a big role to play and I appreciate we're running out of time so we haven't really got into that debate around PBSA versus independent landlord properties but I still think there is a, a big role for for independent landlords to play for both students and the private rental sector, as always, because we can do things a little bit differently and a little bit more nimbly. So I, I, I certainly wouldn't not look at student. Uh, it's just that I've, there's a certain property I've been looking at for some time that's, that's quite interesting to me, but I'm not actively looking for student at the moment. <laughs> not actively looking, except when it looks really shiny. So we, we shall leave it there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if you've got any views on student accommodation and whether you think the future is in PBSA or in the private HMO market, please reach out, let us know. You can contact us on at B-I-Z of Property on Twitter or email us on show at thebusinessofproperty.com. And Stuart and I look forward to talking to you again next week. Thank you.